Hello, everyone. Welcome to this edition of the Share and Discuss webinar series. Super excited to have you join us. My name is Shola, and we will just allow for a few more seconds for everyone to settle in, and we'll be on our way. Thank you for joining in early. It's exciting to see past speakers and, of course, regular participants at this month's edition. Welcome, Dr. Derek Fish. Welcome. Um, I saw someone else just to call out previous speaker, Mary Han. It's great to see you again. Great to see you, Mama Kamise. Godfrey, thank you for joining early. Thank you, everyone, for for connecting. It's a beautiful sunny afternoon in the city of Lagos today. And um, I hope this edition of the webinar is as exciting and as beneficial for you as you've always had. Today, we're going to take a slightly different approach in getting started. First off, um, there's, a tech, there's a little technical glitch. Our speaker is trying to join, but aside that, we also would love to get feedback from everyone who has participated extensively. If you're joining for the first time, what your expectations are. And then if you've been part, part of it up until, as in if you've been part of previous editions, we'd love to know how beneficial have you found the conversations one, but most importantly, as we look forward for into the new year, what are the things you would love to see? Um, if you would raise your virtual hand or just write into the chat, I'll be happy to have you on, on mute. And then of course, contribute or speak directly to this effect. So it's been 18 months of, of course, coming together once a month to talk about science and math education on the continent and then bringing seasoned speakers who have extensive knowledge, but also practical use of tools such as FET in their, in their practice to then share insights from what they've learned and what they found useful in their research as well. But yeah, that's, that's a part we would love to know. What are the things, what, how can we serve you better? What are the things you'd love to see going forward so that we can consider that as we plan and identify speakers for the next year in particular? So we'd love that you write in the chat. If you'd like to speak, um, please raise your virtual hand and I'll just um, hand the mic over to you. I see in Indileni, apologies if I didn't get that right. Your virtual hand is raised. Would you please unmute? Thank you, Michael. You can also write in the chat where you're connecting from. And then what are the things you'd love to see from us going forward, like the next few months? What type of speakers, what type of conversation do you think we've not spotlighted in the past few months and how so that we can be sure to get those conversations across to you. You can unmute um, in the Lenny. I see you still rich. Did you drop your hand? I don't know. Okay, I see your hand is not raised. That never mind. So anyone wants to share some thoughts around what you'd love to see? Hello, Godfrey. Hello, Michael. Thoughts around what you'd love to see going forward. We want we want feedback. We want to know how to serve how to serve the community better. And hearing from you is, is one important part of that. Okay, any thoughts? Um how just a second. Apologies. Da, 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 da. Um, just a second again, I'm trying to get the speaker to connect now. It was a second and we'll be on our way. Apologies about the, the link in getting started. Yeah, hi, hi Sam. The question again is, it's been 18 months of having these conversations. I think I'll just write it into the chat. We would love feedback from you. What conversations is missing? What have we not touched on? And what you what would you love to see going forward in coming months? Are there particular speakers or conversations 
you think we've not spotlighted that you think the community would benefit from? We'd love to hear from you, but that's 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 the way we thought about it as we consider speakers and then topics for the coming for the coming year for for the year for the for the for the year 2024. We would love to get feedback from participants and attendees what they would love to see. No screen sharing. Apologies, I thought that was on screen already. You should see the screen now. Okay, sure. Dr. Derek, please, the mic is yours. Hi there, I'm just checking that you can hear me. Yes, we hear you good. So um, I think what's interesting is many of us used PHET a lot during COVID. But now, in most cases, we've come out of COVID, and either we're teaching only face-to-face -face or possibly even hybrid. And I think it would be interesting to hear from people experiences about using PHET during lockdown, only virtually, you know, using it in live classrooms and using it in hybrid situations, and how it compares and what's the best way to get the most out of it. I think that would be interesting going forward. Okay, great. Thank you so much for, for your feedback. Um, so if I, yeah, I'll, I'll come to you in a bit, in a bit, Sam. So thank you for that. Of course, there's the transition in terms of gradual or massive move back to face-to-face -to -face and uh, being able to see um, what we learned from, of course, having implemented and used COVID during, used FEDs during COVID and some of the things to consider when we are using any of these methods. Anyone else? I saw Sam, your hand was raised. Would you like to speak as well? Please feel free to write into the chat as well. Anybody else? Um, just a second again, I'm still trying, I'm still getting in touch with the speaker and um, we'll be on our way in a second, this presentation. Um, while we wait, I think I would love to hear Sam over to you. Um, if it's okay to just um, be pointed as well, um, it's okay if if if, you, if if there's no contribution. But I would also love to perhaps just get any thoughts from um, Dr. Mary Han. I guess um, I, I know you 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 frequently joined the conversations, having having also speak um, shared your experience at some point. Would love to hear your thoughts as well. Of course, alongside everyone, every member of the community. What are the things we need to consider going forward and what are the things you'd love to see from us? How can we continue to serve you well? Hi, Sam, over Hello. to you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you good, Sam. Okay, uh, good hour, everyone. You, you know what I, I would suggest? You, you ask us, a, it's a good question, it's a, a, which comes with a good idea. Do you mind if, say, you can produce, uh, you can send one, create a, a Google form in, in the Google form in a questionnaire kind of, so that you, you fill in and then you send it back for the same issue. Yeah, sure, we will do that. And thanks for the feedback. I'm taking advantage of this moment because we can get feedback yeah. real time. Um, while we, we've tried um, questionnaires such as what you've suggested, um, what we've noticed is we don't get everyone's feedback uh, most often, like participation and um, response is not as, as great as we would love. So we were hoping to just take advantage of this particular moment and then um, get your feedback. But well, thank you for sharing that. And uh, oh, we will get to that. And please feel free at any point in time, if you have suggestions around speakers, around um, topics that you think would amplify or like yourself or the community would benefit from, please feel free to get in touch and let us know. And definitely we'll be happy to consider particular speakers or conversations to ensure that we continue to learn from our end, but also from your end and ensure um, you make the most, the very best use of your time any, anytime we meet um, every third Wednesday of the month. Thank you for your feedback. I think um, that was that was useful. We can now hand, we can now get started with today's session um, um, as I introduce our today's speaker. But before that, we'll just do a few getting started as 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 um as a housekeeping rule, as you know, um this webinar holds every third Wednesday and is brought to you by the FET Interactive Simulation Project at the University of Colorado Boulder. The project creates free interactive math and science simulations that are based on extensive education research and engage students through intuitive game-like environments where students learn through exploration and discovery. 
first was founded in 2002 by the Nobel laureate Carl Wyman. And its goal is to improve the global teaching of math and science. We know educators and teachers like yourself play such an important role in this grand scheme, which is why, of course, we gather monthly to learn from you, but also share what other educators across the continent has found valuable or useful from their research or practice so that we can all, of course, take advantage of the best practices to improve the teaching and learning of math and science in our classroom. We meet every third Wednesday and on the screen, you'd find what the time looks like. It's 4 p.m. GMT. And of course, I know that's that spread across a um, different time based on your look, where you are, look, where the country is, uh, you're situated on the continent. And you can find this recording, this session, as well as past recording on the YouTube page. So you can, you can catch up and continue to follow up or just share with people who might not be able to watch live, perhaps for connectivity or on availability, the conversations continue both on um, both on YouTube where we have an archive of all the sessions as well as the community on Facebook where you can ask questions and get, and get the community to respond to that as well. And while I'm going to introduce our speaker in a bit, um, questions and answers will happen towards the end of the session. So please, if you have questions while the session is ongoing, please feel free to write, to use the question and answer feature in at the bottom part of your screen to drop your questions. And once we get to the end, we've saved time for questions, we'll of course get to all the questions and ensure they all get attended to. And finally, I would invite everyone to join the community on Facebook where you, of course, you get updates and announcements as they break, but also you get support and response to questions you have at various points in your journey using Fed simulations. So without further ado, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today is none other than Dr. Reginald Govanda. He's a math and physics science education lecturer at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa and a Columbia University alumni. He is a recipient of the prestigious ASADLP, that's the Accelerated Academic Leadership Development Program, also in South Africa. And um, of course, which, which, which has, which, has framed a lot of his research interest, which includes teaching and learning of maths and ICT, self-regulated learning, instructional design methods, um, geometry and trigonometry, among others. And today is going to be talking, us, we're going to be considering the topic, the effect of students' self-regulation in virtual lab. What impact does self-regulation has in advancing teaching and learning using FET simulation? Welcome, Dr. Govinda. Um, I see you are here, and please feel free to take. You can take it all from here. Welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Sola, for those uh, introductions. I must uh, apologize. Uh, I was running a bit late uh, to this, but I'm glad that I've made it. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, could I start sharing my screen, uh, Sola? Sure, definitely. I'll just stop sharing mine. Yeah. yeah, we see your screen, but we don't see your slide yet. Just, yeah. Okay. Can you see my slide now? Um, yes. Okay, perfect. Ready. Let me just hide these controls away. Yeah. Okay, now you can see my screen. Yes, perfect. perfect. Okay, thank you. So uh, thank you for, once again, Sola, for those uh, introductions. Uh, a very good evening to the FET community uh, from South Africa. Uh, if you're joining from other parts of the world, a very good morning or a very good day to you. Um, so my name is uh, Dr. Reginald uh, Gavinder. I'm from the Mathematics and Computer Science Education cluster within the School of Education uh, at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. Uh, my uh, research and my focus is on computer science education, so computer programming, 
uh, application development, coding and robotics, the use of ICTs in education, you know, how one would integrate ICT um, in a learning concept or a topic, and geometry as well. Uh, I like to uh, refer to mathematics as my first love. So um, for this presentation, um, the topic for the presentation is the effects of students' self-regulation using VLabs. And it's largely based on uh, a paper that has been published, which is uh, the teaching and learning using virtual labs, uh, investigating the effects of students' self-regulation. So I'm going to start off first by answering some questions uh, as to what is VLab. Uh, for me, in my work and in my uh, uh, research journey, how do I define VLab? So VLab is virtual lab. And for me, a VLab holds certain characteristics. So some of the characteristics would be it has to be uh, some sort of interactive, uh, be on an online platform. Um, it's a simulated environment that mimics some sort of real world event. In some previous work that I've um, that I've done, I've referred to uh, something called DOE, which is called dynamic online environments. And dynamic online environments share the very same characteristics or similar characteristics as VLab. And I'll dive a bit more deeper in that uh, in the slides to come. So I came across uh, this cartoon and uh, when I was preparing the presentation, and I said I have to had this cartoon to the to my presentation and uh, if you look at the cartoon it says there I don't care if your friend has a flight simulator you're going to learn to fly on your own so you know this then led to the next question is why you know why is VLabs um, important or what difference does it make in the teaching and learning uh, sphere so one of the things I looked at was metacognition and metacognition is kind of all about asking yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing? You question your, yourself while you in the process of learning. And, and that is powerful because it leads to some sort of self-realization or self-thought, uh, which then leads to conviction. So what do I mean by conviction? Conviction is when you in a learning space, or you are engaged in some sort of activity, before you can reach the end result, um, as an individual, you already have a sense of what the result is at the end. So it's almost like you have a, you, you already predetermined, you know, you predicted what the end result is. Uh, and simulated environments, somehow, uh, when a student is engaged um, in a virtual lab, whether whatever topic or whatever subject it's based on, uh, there's bound to be some sort of uh, metacognition, some sort of self-realization and conviction that's taking place. So while there's a lot of research that's done around virtual labs, such as the FET uh, uh, systems and simulations that, that's available online, um, there's, there's enough research to say that it has some positive impact on academic performance. But what I was looking for in this research was what impact does it have as on students' independence? And in this particular research, it was a systematic review that was done um, to examine self-regulated learning through the use of VLabs. And the next, you know, when I looked at the theories that you know, we, we one of the seminal pieces of work is ZPD, which is, you know, it's Vygotsky's work. Uh, and, I, and I won't get into the details of it because I'm sure the educationists in the room are quite familiar with this uh, theory. But ZPD is kind of the sweet spot where it's what the student can do with assistance, right? And the cognition and technology group at Vanderbilt they've coined a term called embedded data. And embedded data is referred to as ins or tips that if an individual reaches a block, uh, the individual is able to um, you know, reveal this tip or int. The tip or int doesn't give them the answer, but it rather acts as a guide to the learning path. 
So when we looked at, uh, you know, uh, the COVID-19, the pandemic, and obviously disruptions that take place in the education space, uh, which leads to online or remote teaching and learning, um, there's this relationship graph uh, which maps human interaction to the modes of education. And what we find is that in a traditional education setup, you have the highest level of human interaction. Uh, right now uh, in the Zoom session, I don't know what your facial expression is. I don't know whether you are fidgeting with your finger uh, ready to exit the Zoom session. I don't know whether you are rocking your leg under the table right now, uh, waiting for your dinner or your supper, or whatever uh, that's being made. Um, so there's obviously limited human interaction when we are in a online technology setup, right? Um, in a traditional education setup, oh, sorry, we have... So yes, sorry, um, Sorry to cut you, cut you short, but just to take advantage of what you're saying, your camera is off. I just thought I should let you know what everyone, there, there's been some comments to, to see your face. Okay, okay, okay. So that okay. we can Sorry. have some, some deeper yeah, interaction. That, 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 yeah, sure, that, that, is, that is the human interaction that I, I was talking about in an online setup. Let me just uh, get my controls. Um, let's see where... It is it ID? Okay. Can you see me now? Yeah, okay. Yes, we see you good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Apologies. Thank, thank you for that, uh, Salah. So as I was saying, um, a Fed community that in an, um, uh, in an online edu uh, technology education setup, you have um, very limited human interaction, right? You don't see the person's facial expression, the body language, et cetera. So Vykotsky claims that we are born with four elementary or, or primary functions, which is attention, uh, sensation, perception, and memory. And these functions obviously develop over time due to our social and our cultural environment. And also the learning environment plays a very big role in that. And when we look at uh, FET simulations and, and what a simulation does in the learning environment, it actually enhances um, these mental functions. So just a side side note and a fun fact uh, in the next few slides before I get back to my uh, to my research and, and the topic, I did a search of the term FET interactive uh, simulations, and this was a global search, and this was from 2020 to 2022. Uh, it's the first Jan 2023. Uh, so that's over a three-year period, and we find that obviously there's... Um, peaks and there's uh, obviously dips in the interest of FET simulations. And it's understandable because it could be uh, the term end or a semester break, spring break, et cetera. I then went ahead and did a, a visual map uh, of uh, the FET simulation. And you find that uh, in this period in 2018, 2019, in that year gap, uh, we find that in the Americas, you find that FET simulations are widely used. Um, which is interesting. I then went ahead on and I said, let me look at what is the trends post COVID, you know, the pandemic, you know, uh, in the 2020, 2023, when we're in that pandemic stage where there's like uh, some sort of lockdowns. I know in some countries, uh, they relaxed the lockdowns and schools got back uh, to normal. Um, so in that 2020, uh, 2020, 2021, and 2023, in that gap, what did it look like? And what we find is, we find this um, the spread across on the east part of the world where FET simulations are now being used, which is quite interesting. By the way, the numbers that you see on the screen are not the percentages, they're just the averages uh, per links or, or clicks to the uh, website, the FET website. We then looked, I zoned into South Africa because that's where I'm from. And here again, we find the interest over time. Uh, and that is a result of term breaks, et cetera. But what's interesting here is that all nine provinces in South Africa, we have hits on FET simulations, meaning that there's a likelihood that you would go into any province in South Africa and you would come across a teacher or a student who is quite familiar with the FET simulation uh, they've used it in their class or or, or etc so coming back to my presentation today 
And while we're on the topic, uh, you know, zoned into FET simulations, I look, I'm going to focus on graphing lines and specifically the line game. And if any uh, colleague wants to join uh, in this um, in this uh, simulation, uh, if you've got a smartphone or a tablet, you can scan the QR code on your screen and you can maybe experiment uh, while I discuss this. So when you click on the line game, um, it presents you with different levels. Uh, when you enter a level, you have a random question that uh, comes up or a problem that comes up. In this particular problem, it said, set the Y intercept. It gave me the line graph. It presented the line graph to me, which is Y is equal to two over three X minus five. We know the standard form of the line graph is Y is equal to MX uh, plus C. Uh, I could ask colleagues if you can uh, give me the gradient, M is equal to what and C is equal to, uh, to what on the chat. Um, and what the simulation does is that you can click on the pink dot that appears on the interactive uh, uh, space and you are allowed to move that line either up or down. And then you click on check. So what I did was that I deliberately um, positioned it in its incorrect place. So I positioned it at plus six. And the simulation gave me a sad face, um, indicating to me that, you know what, uh, something is wrong. And this, um, and it then prompted me to, you know what, try again. So on the second attempt, um, I went and I answered it incorrectly again, right? Just to test the system and see what the simulation actually does. And what you notice is that on the second attempt, um, or incorrect attempt, on the second incorrect attempt, it gives you an option to show the answer. And when you click on show the answer, it then presents you the green line, which depicts the uh, correct answer. And then it shows you the two and the three on the incorrect uh, position of the line. Now, at this stage, there's quite an important, uh, you know, um, uh, important visualization and explanation visually that takes place. And one of the things you immediately notice is gradient is equal to rise over run. Now, if you extend this concept, and although it's an incorrect answer that a student would have provided through the stimulated environment, you could extend this concept simply by what do you notice about the incorrect answer and the correct answer? The lines are equidistant, right? And then it leads to the next topic, you know, the next concept, which is parallel lines. And, and what is the result of parallel lines? It is because of gradients are equal, which you can clearly see, although the answer is incorrect, but you can then extend that, uh, that concept through the incorrect answer, and you could discuss uh, these concepts with the student. I'm then going to share you, with you one of uh, a DOE, which is a dynamic online environment, which is, as I said, it shares the same characteristics as a, a VLAB. And this is on Fibonacci.Africa, which, uh, which is a website that uh, I created many years ago, and, and the inspiration for that uh, would take uh, quite some time to share with everyone, which I'm not going to go into. But in this particular uh, uh, simulated environment, um, its angles in the same segment of a circle are equal. And this is a circle geometry theorem. And you, these points, A, B, C, D, the student can freely move them on the screen. The, the values change. Uh, we have, I have steps, which is the way they could click on. So you know, the embedded data that I was talking about. And we saw this in the FET simulate, simulated environment as well, where you got check answer and show answer, uh, where it guides the student in actually proving or the, the theorem, right? And this happens in the absence of a facilitator. So this is what I, what I was referring to as the sweet spot, the ZPD that takes place in the absence of the facilitator when you are in an online environment or is, you know especially here it's a simulated environment so one of the models that um, i like to discuss is this three way relationship which is online technology self regulation and learner centered education 
Now, one of the things with with self-regulation is that Zimmerman, uh, who is one of the key authors around self-regulation, um, he describes self-regulation as an action of self-reflecting and self-monitoring uh, while maintaining a focus on progress and ensuring the achievement of the end goal. So when you think about this three-way relationship, your online technology in this case is a VLAB, a virtual Envi uh, environment, a virtual lab, um, self-regulation, you know, it involves obviously the self-realization, the conviction, it's a metacognitive, the student is engaged in a metacognitive state or metacognitive activities that they're engaged in. And in its true sense, what it promotes, it promotes learner-centered education because the facilitator does not necessarily has to be, have to be present. Uh, in this activity. So in the study design, which is uh, which was a systematic review uh, study, which was conducted, uh, the study aimed to, to determine the effects of VLABs on self-regulated learning. Uh, there were 51 articles that were initially identified uh, from the Web of Science database. Um, and as a result of uh, PRISMA, which is the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis, um, we followed those guidelines. And as an output, we had 16 eligible articles uh, that met the criteria for me to look at. The actual process, I won't get too much in detail, but it's explained in the paper. And one of the things that I've learned through the process is garbage in, garbage out, simply because when you are uh, sifting through information uh, in a database, uh, whatever input, whatever keywords that you choose uh, are quite important because if you input, uh, you know, your input is not specific, you are not going to get uh, the results that you are looking for uh, at, at the end, uh, whatever that's being extracted. So the 16 articles are mentioned, uh, which you could have a look in, in, in the full paper, but the six key themes that emerged from the process is what's important, you know, uh, that actually reflects on what is the effects of students' self-regulation using VLABs. And these six themes, are not, they are not in order uh, in any way. But the first one is nurture. And what do we mean by nurture is that what you notice in any simulated environment, uh, the ones that were discussed now, which is like, you know, the FET system, um, is that there's always a progressive development that is encouraged. Because when you click on the game, you would find these different levels that an individual or student would select. Um, the nurturing is quite critical in, in that process uh, as it almost promotes self-paced learning. Because it puts the student in charge of their progress online. When we look at learner-centered, truly learner-centered, and I think I touched on this in the previous slide, but when you look at you know, being in a, in a truly learner-centered environment, um, the instructor or the facilitator who is the gatekeeper, right? Who you're seen as the ultimate gatekeeper, um, is not there in an online environment. Uh, the student is, is allowed to take control in crafting their own education environment. They, they are allowed to self-explore, self-discover. They are allowed to make the risks or you know, even make some mistakes. It's fine uh, in this virtual environment. When we look at visualization, and I, and I know that for most uh, mathematics, uh, people in mathematics, you know, visualization plays quite an important role. Um, and visual effects in a simulated environment, it actually takes the abstract concept um, and it makes it understandable in a concrete manner. I take for an example, the y is equal to two over three x minus five. Imagine telling a student for, you know, uh, that, you know what, equal gradients um, means that the lines are parallel. Um, it, it might not make any sense to a student, but if you visually, uh, take them into the simulation and show them wh what you mean. And even if it was an incorrect answer, but there's concepts that can be discussed through that, um, that is quite powerful. When we talk about digital natives, and here I think, you know, it depends on 
um, it was the papers that were were based on the you know in the results. Uh, maybe they, they were not from um, countries that are still in you know developing countries, but when we talk about digital natives, is that those students um, are quite highly motivated to use V Labs simply because uh, they've been grown up with technology all around them, and for them, they would find using such tools. Uh, quite easily, you know, to navigate um, and be familiar with the environment, uh, go online, um, etc. When we talk about the learning experience, the learning experience is, you know, and from previous research, you know, we know that V labs, such as the FET uh, systems, uh, you know, environments that are available, they are quite highly interactive. Um, you, you think, for an example, some of the physical science uh, topics that are available where there's color and there's animation that takes place, those add to the learning experience, a positive learning experience. Um, it makes the experience enjoyable for the student. Right? And some of the, you know, maybe the future work that I like to see, you know, while I'm on the learning experience uh, theme, uh, what I'd like to see around simulated environments is maybe AI powered simulations. We've we've been hearing about artificial intelligence in education, uh, you know, from last year with uh, you know Chat GPT and stuff. Maybe AI powered simulations, which offers maybe more personalized feedback, um, the ability to measure uh, learning assimilation rates. So if you would want to uh, see how fast the learner gets to the end result in the simulation or gets the answer correct, uh, that might be useful uh, in, in a simula uh, simulated environment. When I looked at management skills and when we looked at the articles, um, management skills is, is just not about the learner being in co control uh, you know, and managing their learning, but it also improves their self-efficacy in other areas of their life. Because VLabs offer um, a pedagogical shift to student-led learning, which encourages a very explorative uh, attitude and willingness to experiment. And you'd likely to see that uh, in that student, uh, you know, when they are engaging in other subjects, right, which maybe does not use uh, simulated software, but you'll find that they will have this uh, explorative attitude and this willingness to experiment, uh, you know, uh, with uh, the content. And that actually leads to like a long life impact in that individual. Uh, colleagues, I've come to the end of my presentation. Um, it was, I, I hope I didn't take too long. I didn't bore you. Uh, thank you to Sola and the FET team you know, for the invite. I know it was long overdue, but finally I'm here and I've presented. Uh, I would maybe hand over back to Sola for uh, some Q and A's. Okay, great. Thank you so much um, for, for, for the presentation. Um, yeah, please, um, if you have questions at this point, this is a good time to ask. Please use the question and answer feature, just write or write in the chat and we will pick it up. If you're also connecting from Facebook, please feel free to write in the chat there. We will pick it up and take it up from there. Um, so Dr. Marihan is saying, thank you, Reg. Um, it was very interesting. So while we're waiting for questions to come through, I'll, I'll just like to pick on, thank you for, uh, of course, the amazing presentation. You did speak about um, how, of course, your research around how FET of, of, of virtual lab helps students develop self, self efficacy that can then translate or transfer into developing capacity around, of course, student led learning, where they can um, be more expressive, ask questions which are more attributes of um, a, a natural scientist who is probing or finding um, questions. But this, this attitude that these two support um, from your learning and looking at our audience as educators, what advice do you have for us as educators in terms of designing activities, um, questions, or just the learning experiences that the students will carry out 
what advice do you have for us as educators to look out for so that we can take advantage of this and help students basically take advantage of the meta cognitive process that is ongoing that whole thinking through reflecting and it could be a reflection that that whole spectrum what advice do you have in terms of being able, what should we look out for or what do we need to start building into our practice that will then enable us to take advantage of this possibility thank you uh thank you sola for that uh question um yeah so you know uh when we generally talk about technology or ICT, ICTs in education, um, you know, when you think about simulations, it's just not about using a simulated environment in the class just to say, well, you know what, I used it today in my class. I think there's got to be some level of planning that needs to be involved um, because, you know, you go back to the to the line game, right? Um, if a student had got, you know, two incorrect attempts, there should be maybe some follow-up questions uh, that the teacher could pose the next day. Uh, you know, if, if you got it incorrect, what did you notice about your incorrect answer and the correct answer? And, you know, the student would obviously say, you know what, uh, the two over three, the M, the value of M is the same. So I think uh, when it comes to uh, simulated environments um, and 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 trying to engage students in a metacognitive, uh, you know, um, get them to think in, uh, uh, get them thinking about what they are doing, uh, getting them to be self-reflective in what they are doing, I think it's very important to uh, plan before you actually use a simulated environment. Uh, you would find that you, the simulated environment might be amazing. It could be full of animation, et cetera. Uh, but if it's not implemented or integrated meaningfully into your, into your lesson, um, that can also have uh, you know, some negative impact. Um, you, you think, for an example, like the levels. You know, we talk about nurture and uh, being uh, progressive in its development. Um, you obviously can't, uh, you know, um, go to uh, uh, right to the extreme topic and and dump students in an extreme topic with with a simulated environment, and they have no clue as to what's going on. So it has to be a a, a build up um, as to whatever topic you're trying to uh, get students to learn, uh, and I think that's important, uh, you know, uh, in, in planning that uh, so that whatever tool that you are using online. Uh, whether it's a simulated tool or it could be some other tool that you are using, um, it's meaningfully integrated. Uh, you know, you always ask, uh, you know, some sort of meaningful questions to students, whether it's asking them questions prior to them being engaged in the simulated environment or even after that, uh, doing a follow-up, uh, you know, type of questions, just so that you could gauge, uh, gauge them further uh, so that you could get them thinking about what they did. Uh, sorry, sorry, Sola. I think you 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 on mute. Yes, I was muted. Thank you for thank you for plugging that. Thanks, everyone. Please keep the questions coming. Um, we'll get to read out all of the questions both on Facebook and here on Zoom in a bit. I just want to take that a little further. So just dwell a little around that all um students reflecting on their own learning around. From what we know about how people learn now, we know that um the old students. Being conscious of the way they learn, or just what they what they are what they are learning per time, can be powerful with retaining what they've learned, um, and that can be more like an extension. That can just be a layer on, or having used a visualization or an interactive tool that can that has helped visualize some abstract concept, even pushing that further. Um, I of the opinion that the way perhaps we engage students around question. Being able to allow them to reflect, maybe of course, as against answering questions, actually having them to um, write their reflection around what they've learned can also be a powerful tool. I don't know, but I, I think that is not a common method in terms of evaluation um, within our context. I just wanted to hear from your viewpoint, like, what do you think around that and how can we as educators begin to find ways 
to integrate such methods that are that are proven effective around, um, of course, students taking advantage of the metacognitive process in in our evaluation of learning, but also ensuring that students are able to retain a lot of the things that they've been exposed to. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that there's quite a few things I want to touch. Uh, firstly, uh, on is that uh, I think you mentioned visualization, and you know, as I said, uh, you know. Uh, I think most educationists, maybe in, in the more practical work, uh, mathematics or uh, even physical science, uh, they would appreciate visualization because it allows one to see exactly what is happening because visualization is a very powerful uh, way to communicate uh, in the teaching and learning sphere than rather just explaining something verbally to someone and they're having no clue as to what you are talking about. Um, I, I think you mentioned something about older students having to retain some concepts. Uh, was it something along those lines, uh, Sola? Can you just uh, recap that for me? Yes, um, I was saying like using reflection um, towards mm -hmm. the end of it, of a learning activity can be a powerful tool in helping students retain um, what they've learned, but it's not commonly used in classroom, either for the time constraints, or I, I just wanted to hear from your opinion, how can we take advantage of many of these best practices or how, what, are, what examples do you have that we can consider so that we can take advantage of this tool set or toolkit in our classrooms? Yeah, so, you know, uh, you know, one of the things when it comes to, uh, and, and since you brought that up, you know, with older students having to retain some concepts, you know, we, there's, there's a whole section on the eradication of misconceptions. And one of the things in simulated environments that they do is that they are very powerful in eradicating that misconception because the student can change and change and try to move their mouse and, and change something in the simulated environment and they're still getting the same answer. And then they have this, this moment in their in their learning experience where you know what what I've learned for the past five years I have to get rid of it and, and rewrite this new uh, uh, you know my learning as to what really happens when I move this point A to this uh, to this side this is what happens to the angle or it changes so when it comes to reflection um, the one way of looking at it could be reflection in the sense of after they complete an activity, you could ask them to reflect on that. Uh, that could be uh, through some sort of survey like Google Forms or something. Um, there are some other environments like uh, Mentees. If, if anybody heard of that, uh, that online platform, you could use Mentees or even Soapbox, for an example. Soapbox does that as well, where you could have a running poll uh, like a, uh, a Q and A while you are presenting, and you could get students to answer, almost like a clicker type of system. You know, when when you lecture and then you've got students holding clickers in their hands to provide you with answers, almost something similar to that, where you can ask a question and you almost you know you'd get the results almost immediately uh, to gauge whether the student is understanding the work or they're having some sort of difficulty. But the reflection can also be looked at and especially with the model that I've uh, shared uh, the three-way uh, relationship model with online technology self-regulation um, and learner-centered education uh, that type of metacognition that we talk about is something that happens on a, on a personal on an individual basis it's something that the student encounters while they are most likely working through the simulated environment um, and, and that is where, uh, you know, the conviction that I was talking about and the self-realization uh, comes uh, comes in. Uh, so sometimes it might be difficult for a student to actually describe that experience to us. Um, but obviously there could be ways uh, in which we could formulate questions around that uh, to gauge students further. And I think that that also, uh, you know, one of the future work that I was talking about where we have AI powered simulated environments where you could assess uh, assimilation rates uh, uh, through an AI powered uh, tool, a simulated environment that it'll give you some useful information uh, as to 
you know, the rate in which the student completed this particular simulated environment, whether it was correct, whether it was incorrect. So I think that can be uh, quite useful, uh, you know, going forward uh, and maybe some sort of development around uh, such simulated environments uh, would be quite, uh, you know, uh, useful. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I'm going to be reading out a lot of the feedback um, from the chat now. Um, Shinaka says, I enjoyed your presentation alongside many who have said thank you for the useful meeting and conversations. Shut an interesting presentation. Um, we have a question from Facebook and it reads, um, what is the theory guiding your study? I know you mentioned that. If you can just speak to that in a minute or less. Um, what's what's the question? What is the theory guiding your theory? What is the theory guiding your study? So, the theory that guides uh, the study, uh, it firstly it's uh, Vygotsky and you know ZPD, which is a zone of proximal development, uh, and what we, you know, what we try to achieve or what I try to argue is that. The zone of proximal development, which I regard as the sweet spot, uh, because it's what the student can do with the capability of some help. That zone of proximal development does not necessarily, you don't have to have a facilitator or a teacher present at that moment. Because when you move into an online environment, uh, and you know, I reflect back onto the pandemic where you had students all over the world. Um, maybe with, you know, some students even longer than few days without any teachers guiding them, but work being given to them. So having a simulated environment uh, where they could reach that sweet spot, um, have the embedded data present, uh, where if they reach a, a roadblock while interacting with the simulated environment, click on some of the buttons that are available, maybe it will reveal some tip or int just to guide them back onto the correct learning path. Um, so that's, uh, uh, you know, the the theory or the conceptualization comes from uh, Vygotsky's uh, ZPD. And obviously some of the, the model, the model that I showed you, the three-way model, I try to build on that uh, where you create uh, whatever online technology that you might have or introduce in your classroom, um, you know, the creation and designing of that uh, and the implementation is important so that you can promote that self-regulation, that metacognitive, um, you know, uh, activity, get, get students engaged in that, uh, which then promotes that old learner-centered uh, education environment where a teacher doesn't have to be always on the back of the student and that's what i uh, you know we, we talk about the the self discovery or the or, or the student having the freedom uh to create their own learning path self paced learning uh in an online uh environment great thank you so much um we 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 we're, 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 we're pressed for time now so i would appreciate oh, yeah, yeah. So, yes yeah, sorry sir yeah sorry so sorry just be, yeah sorry before before i continue and obviously uh uh, self-regulated learning and uh, Zimmerman, uh, yeah, Zimmerman's paper 2000, Zimmerman 2000, uh, is, is that paper and, and most of his work around self-regulation uh, also forms the theory behind uh, what I've presented. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So this is like a, this is like a, an obvious answer as well. There's a question from Fabot that says, um, okay, I'll, I'll let you answer. Do the six key themes also apply to some of the some of our African settings in which technology is still very new? Yeah, so uh, very interesting question and thank you for that uh, question. Um, I think, uh, you know, when you look at the different themes that, 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 are pre that I presented, I think, uh, you know, you look at it as a spectrum uh, and you find that in some of those themes, maybe in an African setting, uh, we have not reached the full potential of that. But what's important is that when, when you look at the awareness around technology on the African continent and, and what COVID actually did was that it actually like, kind of pushed us, forced us to use 
such tools like the FET simulations um, to continue with education, right? So um, you find that we are developing and we will get to that stage uh, as compared to some of the other countries uh, that are there. Uh, so some of the themes that are mentioned, uh, like for an example, and I'll just go back uh, just to, like for an example, the digital natives that I talk about, um, that is definitely something that we haven't reached the full potential because obviously we have uh, places, uh, locations in our in our country that doesn't even have uh, proper infrastructure, internet infrastructure. So how do you expect students to even get online uh, in situations like that? And that is the reality uh, that we face. Um, but having said that, uh, you know, we just hope for the best. And, you know, we know that we, we are heading in the right direction by, you know, having sessions like uh, the one that we're having now to engage um, so that, uh, you know, we could share and our experiences and obviously, you know, um, see how we how best we can implement uh, some of the tools uh, that are available. So, yeah. Great. Um, I think this might be our last question. There are, there are a ton of other questions, um, but some of them are not particularly aligned with today's conversation. So I see things around how FED can help teach physics and all of that. Please, I just dropped the link to the community on Facebook in the chat. I'd encourage you to join the community and then all of the questions that are, of course, relevant, but not in line with today's conversation, definitely will get all the time and attention there. So apologies, we can't take that because of our time. We have two more questions now. Mike, I'm going to get to you now. I see you're raising your hand and I'll read out Dr. Derek Fish's um, question as well. And we'll be forced, we'll have to call it a day because we, we don't want to keep anyone here be, beyond um, the time allocated. So Mike, um, you should have permission to speak now. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Please, if you can do that in, in 10 seconds or 15, in another 20 seconds, that would be great. Okay, while Mike is coming up, I would read um, Dr. Derek's face, um, question. His question says, um, Dr. Govinda, I have often used the great FET scene on straight line graphs in teaching physics as I find pupils physics problems with graphs, such as motion, photoelectric effect, internal resistance are really math problem. Have you encountered this? So he's uh, asking, did you get a question? Uh, yeah, you can get... you just repeat that again? Uh, okay, so I, have often that... found, I've, I've often found, I have often found the grid, I have often used the physics theme on straight line graphs in teaching physics. And I find Pukil's physics problems with graphs, which is more like a maths problem than a physics problem. Have you found that, uh, have you found, uh, uh, do you find, is, is that similar? Is, is that, yeah. do you have a similar experience as well? Yeah, so, uh, you know, um, yeah. So, you know, it's quite interesting, you know, uh, we talk about uh, multidisciplinary uh, content. Um, and, you know, you, you look at physics and maths, there's obviously a lot of uh, similarities in terms of the concepts and proportional and what's indirectly proportional, et cetera. And um, physics was something that didn't catch my attention uh, when I was younger. I mean, uh, you know, when I was studying, I mean, I focused more on maths and, and computer science. But yes, I, I think uh, if if uh, you're looking at it from that perspective, uh, I think we have to appreciate the multidisciplinary content that, take, that, that occurs. Like for an example, the straight line graph, uh, where concepts, whatever that's taught in physics or maths can be reinforced. Uh, Take for an example, one of the one of the things that I'm involved in right now is is the whole coding and robotics in education, and one of the things I find is that um, in coding and robotics, there's so much physic uh, physics stuff that's involved, uh, like reading, uh, you know, uh, the voltage and resistors and and all of those stuff because you actually uh, get students to build a little prototype with a microcontroller, et cetera. And you explain all of these concepts and, and, and you then step back and then you ask yourself, you know what, this is multidisciplinary work 
there's actually physics content that's in uh, science content uh, that's in here. So uh, you know, just to uh, to to just uh, you know, just to uh, you know, answer the question, it's yes. You know, there is obviously that uh, relationship that that overlaps uh, between physics and maths, and especially in the simulated environment. In fact, I didn't even look. Uh, when I look at the the line graph and the line game, it didn't occur to me anything about uh, physics. Uh, but I know that on the FET simulation, there are uh, science uh, simulations that uh, are available. No, sorry, that are available. Great, thank you so much. Um, we we we're past past our time. Apologies if we can't get to your question, Mike. In particular, I would have to apologize. Please look at the chat. I've dropped the link to the group. Um, feel free to get in touch directly and or just post in the group and we'll get to your questions, even if I have to pass, pass them across um, to Dr. Govenda and then get back to you. We'd like to thank everyone for joining today. Um, apologies for taking a little for like, a, a minute longer. We'd be here to do that. Um, but unfortunately, we it's it happened and we'll, we'll be sure to avoid that in future sessions. Thank you for joining. I hope you found the conversation useful and relevant to your practice as much as we've enjoyed bringing it to you. We also would like to thank our speaker for today. Um, thank you for joining. We hope that you make it you, you make it a date again with us next week or next month, sorry, as we bring you another speaker and another interesting topic. Thank you for joining today and um, we look forward to seeing you next month. Bye for now, everyone. Bye, Dr. Govinda. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um...